Baffin Island's northern coastline. From rugged islands and Arctic fjords lining Baffin Bay to the snow-capped peaks and contours of the Borden Peninsula, exploring the unique hamlet of Pond Inlet. Well, I think when the whalers came up here, they thought they were the first people to penetrate this part of the, the globe. The awe-inspiring vistas of Sumalik National Park. The Arctic is an incredible part of the Canadian imaginary. I believe that it's part of who we think we are. And a northern cultural timeline that has endured thousands of years. It makes me wonder about my ancestors, how they traveled through the land. Now, we reveal the secrets of Canada's northern boundary, more than 160,000 kilometers of Arctic frontier. Canada over the edge. High above the waters of Baffin Bay, we approach Nova Zembla Island and the shores of Canada's high Arctic. Baffin Bay measures more than 600,000 square kilometers, a massive body of water separating Greenland from Canada's Arctic archipelago. This is where the Atlantic Ocean meets the Arctic Ocean. And here, in the heat of Arctic summer, we witness a rare sight. Open water stretches for kilometers with Coots Inlet to the southwest and the spectacular North Arm. North Arm extends 40 kilometers inland, a majestic northern fjord with steep cliff faces rising more than a kilometer high. Through much of the year, the waters of North Arm experience one of Earth's harshest climates. It is an environment that has been endured by the Dorset and Thule cultures for thousands of years. And it is a landscape that has baffled European explorers for centuries. Martin Frobisher sailed here in 1576, then John Davis in 1585. They could not have imagined the scope of this landmass. In 1616, William Baffin began charting much of the island's east coast, including these waters, more than 500 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. And lining North Arm, massive expanses of snow and ice rise even higher. As we ascend the fjord's glacier runoff, the ice fields of McCulloch Glacier stretch as far as the eye can see. The Baffin Island interior is marked by a vast mountainous spine, a northern extremity of the Canadian Shield. Geologists believe massive ice sheets that once covered Canada originated here some 18,000 years ago. Today, much of the region remains encased in snow and ice.
And here, among the snow-capped summits, Kijivik Mountain rises more than 1,900 meters. It is northern Baffin Island's highest point and is known as one of Canada's ultra-prominent peaks. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Continuing northwest, the ice fields of McCulloch Glacier gradually recede. Here, Arctic summer reveals tundra extending for kilometers. But it is a rare sight. This stretch of Baffin Island is covered in snow and ice nine months of the year. Moving north, we trace the contours of Salmon River. This winding waterway has been a valuable resource for generations. A habitat for Arctic char. And as a destination for early explorers in search of coal and gold. Finally, in the distance, Salmon River empties into a body of water known as Eclipse Sound, with more snow-capped peaks on the horizon. Looking back to the east, the hills rise again. Here, fog and mist shroud the rock faces of Mount Herodie, rising 434 meters from the sea. And as we descend the contours of nearby Mount Morin, the shores of Eclipse Sound meet us once more. Clip Sound is a vast waterway separating Baffin Island from Bylet Island to the north. It is also where the vast expanse of Canada's high Arctic meets modern civilization. As we trace the perimeter of northern Baffin Island, we reach one of the rare settlements in Canada's far north. Pond Inlet lies above the 72nd parallel. 
It is a designation shared by just three other communities in Northern Canada, Arctic Bay, Resolute, and Grease Fjord. Only Russia and Greenland extend this far north. Located more than 8,000 kilometers above the equator, it stands as one of the world's northernmost communities. Pond Inlet has been home to human civilization for thousands of years, with the Dorset people arriving some 3,000 years ago, then mysteriously disappearing. 1,500 years later, the Thule people arrived, ancestors to the modern Inuit. Pond Inlet is known locally as Mittimatalik, or the place where Mittima is buried, an homage to an ancient resident. While locals still use the name, the identity of Mittima is a mystery. Today, Pond Inlet's population is largely of Inuit descent. But there is also a hearty contingent of those from the South, keen to experience this thriving community. Many come and go, but some stay for decades. My name is Philippa Utova. I'm the community archivist in the beautiful Pond Inlet, Nunavut. Pond Inlet is situated in Canada's high Arctic, about 72 degrees 69 north and 77 degrees 95 latitude. When you talk about the high Arctic people, automatically think of long, dark nights and cold and winter. Yes, we do have darkness in the winter from about mid-November to mid-January. But in fact, as you can see today, it's a beautiful day. We have sunshine. Our temperatures in the summer can go up to 18 degrees thereabouts. And it's not just the heat. Summer temperatures are enhanced by 24-hour sunlight, a balance to harsh winter conditions that would have confronted the first settlers here. Well, I think when the whalers came up here, they thought they were the first people to penetrate this part of the, the globe. It was so unknown, but in fact, it, it has been populated. Today's Inuit were in fact not the first people. The Dorset culture and was followed by the Thule culture, which are the actual ancestors of today's Inuit. Originally, the area was named, not the town, but the area was named Ponds Bay, and this was in 1818 when John Ross arrived on an expeditionary ship. Uh, he named it after John Ponds, an astronomer royal in Britain, nothing to do with the local Inuit. But in fact, the Inuit had named this area Mittimatalik for many years before that. In later years when the Hudson Bay Company and the RCMP moved in, the name was transferred to this area as Pond Inlet. Today, the hamlet is home to 1,300 people, most with ties that date back generations. And that is where Philippa Utova's passion for history has become a major contribution to the community. The idea of developing archives started as I worked in the library. Uh, the elders were very concerned that information was not being passed on to the younger generation. Children were moving on to television and things, so photographs seemed to be the best way of connecting the elderly and the young, and that also was supported by the collection of uh, historical books, as many as we could find. And that was the beginning of uh, archives. Well, this is the Pond Inlet Archives. It's a community archives uh, with a focus on preserving local history. One of our priorities is photographs. Uh, this is an example of some of the photographs that we have collected from people who lived here in the past or their relatives have lived here in the past and they're willing to donate 
um, some of their collection to the, to the community. Uh, we very much encourage that because it's a wonderful way of elders and youth uh, connecting. The wonderful thing is that many times uh, today's Inuit have never seen pictures of their relatives and they can then see, see pictures of family members that they may have met once or twice but could also uh, see in a photograph and share with their children themselves. The photo collection helps recall a different era in Pond Inlet, just decades ago, when many residents lived a nomadic lifestyle, living on the land. Another interesting thing, although more recent, is from the 1970s. This is a collection of local newspapers, and it was done in the days before typewriters with Inuktitut syllabics, uh, which of course is the language of the community, so it was all done by hand, and the English was done on a typewriter. The drawings were done by hand also, and it is just daily record really of what went on, what was act the activities of the community at the time, um, what was happening, who was visiting, skidoos were for sale, um, anything of interest to the community. And that, of course, is what becomes so interesting later on in years to come uh, to compare with today and how things have changed in such a short time. And one corner of the archives reveals a wealth of treasures. Inuit language materials, including dictionaries, encyclopedias, and the written histories of the region's elders. The documents date back centuries, as early as 1835. And one of the other interesting parts of our collection is the Archives Northern Reference Collection. This is a collection of books about the North and the history. And one of our prize books, one of our oldest ones, is a volume written by Sir John Ross, who, as I mentioned earlier, was the person who gave the name Ponds Bay to this area. It's a narrative of the Northwest Passage. And of course, the Northwest Passage is still today a very popular transit way. Originally they were trying to get to the Orient, now people are just trying to say that they've been able to travel it themselves in the footsteps of all the explorers. For many, Philippa Utova's life journey that began in England may seem strange, but for her, Canada's north was a calling that could not be ignored. Well, I have lived here many years. I came with a great interest in the north and a passion for seeing northern Canada. I was very welcomed by Inuit when I first came here, of course, and that really helps. You want to stay longer. Uh, I met my husband here. He's uh, from this community, and we have four children and several, five grandchildren now. <laughs> and of course, one stays where one's home is. Pond Inlet marks one of the rare communities on northern Baffin Island. It is a major commercial and transportation hub in the Kikitalik, or Baffin region. But just beyond the hamlet's boundaries, some of the world's most stunning landscapes stretch as far as the eye can see. As we head west along the edge of Canada's northern expanse to Nuiaktalik Point and Ekeperiaktalik Point extend far out to sea and lead to massive fjords on the horizon.
And in the distance, a massive headland or cliff face dropping straight to the sea. It is stunning Kobignalik headland, rising nearly a kilometer high. It marks the entrance to Oliver Sound, a pristine waterway connected to Eclipse Sound and part of Sermalik National Park. Further, the landscape changes as we approach a series of unique islands and winding waterways. Here, Frechette Island and Emerson Island are surrounded by Tay Sound and Packet Sound, extending kilometers to the south. Even here, in the heart of Baffin Island's beauty, it is difficult to comprehend the sheer size of this island. Baffin Island is 1,500 kilometers long and measures more than 500,000 square kilometers. It is more than 15 times the size of Vancouver Island. Amazingly, virtually all of Baffin Island remains uninhabited, home to just 11,000 people. It is the largest island in Canada and the fifth largest in the world. Continuing west, we descend from the mountains and fjords on approach to the waters of Eclipse Sound. Icebergs are a common sight here, incredible frozen masses that reveal just one-eighth their true size. This berg has drifted more than 1,000 kilometers from the west coast of Greenland. Icebergs on Baffin Bay can travel roughly three kilometers a day, with many making their way as far south as Newfoundland and beyond. Here, they stand as a testament to the beauty of the region. And some, like this one, are a favorite spot for seals to catch some Arctic summer sun. Further, we explore the majestic sea life of Milne Inlet. Milne Inlet is more than 40 kilometers long, with Ragged Island marking its northern boundary with Eclipse Sound. And here, from high above, ripples can be seen a disturbance on this otherwise calm waterway. A closer look reveals hundreds of narwhal.
Milne Inlet is one of the world's best known calving grounds for these unicorns of the sea. Narwhals are medium-sized whales, often seen in groups of 15 or 20. They can range in size from four to six meters, weighing 1,600 kilograms. But they are best known for their massive tusks, a feature proudly displayed by mature adult males. This sword-like tooth can reach nearly three meters. No one knows exactly what it's used for. Some say it can dig holes in sea ice. Others believe the size of the tusk determines social standing. In total, Canada is a summer home to 80,000 narwhal, a population that migrates to the open waters of Davis Strait and Baffin Bay in the winter. They are a prize catch for hunters. Legend says the Vikings exported narwhal tusks in the Middle Ages, reaching Europe and the Far East, where it earned the mythical nickname, Unicorn of the Sea. Today, they are a key source of income for Inuit hunters. Narwhal tusks can be sold for hundreds, even thousands of dollars. North of Milne Inlet, the waters of Eclipse Sound lie at the heart of a key Arctic protected area. This incredible expanse of wilderness is known as Sermalik National Park. It is a massive area, measuring 22,000 square kilometers, jointly managed by local Inuit and Parks Canada. My name is Jana Mokosak and I work in Simulik National Park as an interpretation officer in Pond Inlet. The park was created in 1999. It, it was created so that our land could be protected and preserved for future generations. The significance of the park name Similic mean place of glaciers, and majority of our park is made up of glaciers, rock, and ice. Sermalik National Park is one of the largest parks in Canada. It includes a marine area, as well as four separate parcels of land. Right behind me, you can see the incredible Bylet Island, which has been a protected area since before it was Similic National Park. 
The Borden Peninsula is just to the west, and it is a, basically a large plateau of mountains undercut by some amazing braided river valleys. And it houses some, as well as archaeological remains, there's some really cool old hoodoos, so fantastic blocky red and ochre sandstone towers leaping out of the ridge lines, which are pretty stunning. The tiniest little piece is just to the west of that. It's another set of sea cliffs for nesting birds called Bellarge Bay. And a little bit closer, but also to the west of us, is the marine portion of the park, which is Oliver Sound. And this is your classic steep-sided fjord. It's a beautiful place for kayaking and boating and is well worth visiting. The park is home to a diverse spectrum of life, from hardy Arctic plants to animals inhabiting land and sea. One of the fantastic things about Simulik National Park is that it lies in an area of incredible diversity. Their life here is rich, both terrestrial and marine. The kind of wildlife we have up here, polar bear, in some areas, there's a uh, caribou. With sea mammals, there's a uh, ring seal, harp seal, bullhead whales, narwhal, and beluga. But unlike many parks, there was a crucial cultural element as well. Sermalik National Park is a harvesting ground for indigenous peoples. For centuries, Inuit hunters have sustained their families and communities with the rich plant and animal life found on land and sea. In the park, there are some archaeological sites, remains such as sod houses, bones, artifacts, and other tools that were used by the Inuit before they were known as the Thule culture and Inuit come from the Thule culture and today they still use it. Some people have outpost camps around the area and Inuit still go hunting using the land. Today, with Sermalik's park status, the land is shared between modern day harvesters and adventurous tourists alike. When visitors are planning to come up to our park, I think their expectation is that there'll be a a lot of ice and a lot of nothing. <laughs> but after visiting, they realize that there's more to the Arctic, there's more wildlife, and that uh, this environment, even though it's so huge, it's very sensitive. People come up here for a number of reasons. The landscape is stunning, and there's an incredible culture in the area as well, which is another draw for people. Uh, the Arctic is... The Arctic is an incredible part of the Canadian imaginary. I believe that it's part of who we think we are and how it makes us Canadian. For Jenna Mukasek, protecting the Sermalik area means her children can be raised along the same shores as she was and her family before her. Seeing this land, our home, and the different characteristics like the glaciers, the, the mountains, the land, it makes me wonder about my ancestors, how they traveled through the land and what they experienced going through the land, using the land, and going day by day. Heading north over Eclipse Sound, we return to glacier country as we soar above the stunning features of Sermalik National Park.
25 kilometers north of Pond Inlet, Violet Island is a protected gem with a diverse landscape. Here, steep ocean cliffs and lowland tundra are a perfect habitat for seabirds. Three hundred twenty thousand thick billed murres. Fifty thousand black legged kittiwakes. and thousands of greater snow geese utilize the area. Continuing to the center of the island, Violet Island's glaciers ascend rapidly. Ice fields stretch for kilometers. Here, mountains like the Castle Gables are part of the Bayam Martin Mountains, running east to west along the northern half of the island. The mountains are part of the Arctic Cordillera chain that extend 1,300 kilometers from Labrador in the south to Ellesmere Island in the far north. Further, we pass Obelisk Mountain and Malik Mountain, which at more than 1,900 meters is the highest point on the island. Further, the mountains recede as we reach the northern extremity of Violet Island and the waters of Lancaster Sound. It is a stunning shoreline, adorned with rocks and jagged ice, and home to the region's most iconic animal, the polar bear. They are majestic creatures, perfectly equipped for the harsh Arctic climate. With dark skin to absorb the heat of the sun and thick white fur for camouflage and warmth. And beneath it all, a thick layer of fat to keep them warm. Polar bears thrive on land or sea. They are considered marine mammals and can swim nearly 10 kilometers per hour. Heading west, we follow the shores of Lancaster Sound across Navy Board Sound to the shores of the Borden Peninsula. Here, we trace the contours of the Killity River.
Not far inland, the walls of the river valley rise, and we experience one of the region's most breathtaking landscapes. The Borden Hoodoos are tall towers of sedimentary rock carved over centuries by water and wind. A stunning contrast to the ice fields of Violet Island just kilometers away. At the northern extremity of Baffin Island, the Borden Peninsula is a scenic gem. Here, west of Sermalik National Park and the Borden Hoodoos, we soar above deep river valleys, Arctic tundra, and snow-capped rolling hills. But 50 kilometers to the west, the landscape changes again on approach to spectacular Strathcona Sound. Strathcona Sound stretches some 50 kilometers from the peaks of the Borden Peninsula to the waters of Admiralty Inlet. Its cliff walls rise majestically, a hidden Arctic geological wonder. And halfway to the waters of Admiralty Inlet, we reach the abandoned town of Nana Civic. Nana Civic was once an industrial hotbed with a bright future. In 2007, the Canadian government announced Nana Civic would be the site for Canada's first northern deep water port, part of an attempt to further develop the north. But years later, nothing has happened. A deep water port remains a dream. And further inland, Nana Civic was the site of Canada's first Arctic mine, extracting zinc for more than 25 years. It closed in 2002, and the town closed with it. All that remains is an airport and mining roads that were part of Nana Civic's most unique feature. Nana Civic was home to one of the world's most famous road races, the Midnight Marathon. A mecca for runners from around the world who thought they had done it all.
Beyond Nanasivik, we reach the western extremity of the Borden Peninsula and move from a ghost town to a modern day community. Arctic Bay lies on the shores of Adams Sound, with Admiralty Inlet beyond. Arctic Bay marks the end of our journey. Located even further north than Pond Inlet, one of just three Canadian communities above the 73rd parallel. A true gem in Canada's high Arctic. From the stunning waters of Baffin Bay and remote Nova Zembla Island, to the community of Pond Inlet and Bylet Island to the north, to the natural wonders of Sermalik National Park, Northern Baffin Island is a scenic journey unlike any other. It's ice fields and hoodoos. Steep cliffs and frigid waters. And incredible animal life are a timeless wonder. Nearly untouched since the arrival of European explorers and the indigenous people before them. Years later, Baffin Island remains a wonder that many have imagined, but few will experience here on the edge of Canada.